Hi, I'm Billy Goodnick, your host, and welcome to Garden Wise, Santa Barbara's favorite place to learn about sustainable landscaping. Quick question for you. Which is greater, the number of people living on the planet or the number of beneficial microbes in a teaspoon of soil? There is your answer. I'll take you to Island Seed and Feed in Old Town Goleta and we'll learn about the ingredients you can add to your garden to create a living, vibrant soil. Hi, I'm at Island Seed and Feed with Brent Tunstall and we're talking about what happens when uh, somebody's finally given up their lawn, they've stripped off all the old stuff and they're getting ready to plant some nice low water using ornamental plants. Uh, there's more to it than just digging a hole and putting them in the ground. So let's get a little advice on what people might do on a, on a visit to Island Seed and Feed. Educate me on, uh, on what we do before I start picking all your beautiful plants out here. All right, well, the first thing we're gonna do is um, we need to rebuild the soil. Um, when you've scraped all your, your previous lawn away, you take a, all, the, all the old clumps of dirt and the top couple inches of soil, right. and you've taken out maybe 80% of the microbial life of the soil. So by microbial life, what are we talking about there? We're talking about the little creatures, uh, microscopic, you can't even see them, that uh, help create the soil food web. They, they take nutrients, they break them down, they keep the sort of cycle going, and with them in there, you have a nice ecosystem to grow a plant in. So the soil is more than just the dirt your dog tracks into the Yeah, carpet. there is a lot of life in yeah, the soil. The chemical fertilizers that most people use on their lawns uh, actually end up uh, killing or really setting back the microbial uh, community in the soil. They are made of uh, salts that uh, just sort of, well, they salt the soil and they end up stripping the life out of it. So it's well. just, it, it's a bad environment to start with. So our first job is to bring the soil back to life. Yes, get it, get it going again. Feed the soil, feed the microbes, and get them to recolonize and uh, get your yard booming again. So what are the first ingredients we need to, to get things rolling, to get this former lawn back into something for our plants? Well, the first thing I would suggest to you is our landscape mix. Mm -hmm. And this is a blend that we have made for us of alfalfa, soybean, fish, kelp, and uh, fish meals. And uh, in this combination, you can really help bring the soil back to life and get some of the uh, building blocks of plant, uh, plant nutrition back into the life, back into the soil. So it's not an immediate uh, re result. It takes about two weeks for the, plant, for the plants to finally be able to pick the stuff up. Huh. So it's not a bang, instant, instant thing, right. instant results, it's uh, down the road. So I'm looking at these numbers here. Is this your zip code, your uh, uh, mailing address? Uh, no, these numbers that? are NPK. Uh, most fertilizers will have these on them. It's the first number is nitrogen, which is a uh, building block for uh, making your plants green, uh, growing a big structure. The second number is phosphorus, and that is for uh, blooming, flowering. Mm -hmm. Last number, potassium is typically thought of as building roots or plant vitality strength. Now, I thought NPK was no pink kangaroos. It was for keeping marsupials from... Well, maybe down under, but up here it's NPK. Uh, we have worm castings, and this is uh, essentially the poop of worms. They've consumed, uh, uh, they've consumed um, plant material, uh, digested it, and then what's left is this super high quality compost that is full of uh, fungi, bacteria, um, microorganisms. So putting this into the soil will actually be supplying the creatures that will be cons eating and consuming the landscape mix right. or the larger fertilizers. It, it's sounding like quite a delicious cake. We're getting there. Point. Right, worm poop, let's see what else. Anything else in here? You've got well, so many things to The one last with. thing that I would recommend is the landscape mix gives you the macronutrients, the NPK. Another option or another vital component of the soil are the micronutrients, mm. sort of um, lesser ones, but that really um, have a, a big role to play in the health of plants. And one, the best way, the fastest way to get this in to the soil is through azomite, which is uh, a volcanic uh, mineral that's mined in Utah. And uh, it comes in two ways, a powder form and a granular form. Uh, the powder will react quicker and the granular, easier to use, you can throw it around 
and it will sort of dissolve over successive waterings. So uh, you gave me a great education on the uh, things to stimulate the soil. I forgot to ask, how do we actually get it into the soil? What, what makes it work? Okay, um, it only needs to be in the top several inches of the soil. So I would just, uh, instead of turning everything over, I would just take a hard rake and rake it in and uh, get it incorporated into the top inch or so and uh, then cover it with some sort of mulch. Are you a believer in rototillers? No, not necessarily. I, I don't use one. Uh, they tend to go down and disrupt the entire uh, web of soil. Certain microbes live at certain levels in the soil. And so if you take the ones that are at the bottom and bring them up to the top, they're no longer at home. They'll reorient themselves, but you set yourself back. So you don't have to sit there smelling the, uh, the fumes off the No, you don't have to smell that That's either. That's fabulous. So we've got it worked into the soil. We rake it in gently. Uh, time to go buy plants? No, I would suggest now to cover it uh, with some sort of mulch. Uh, and it can be thin. It should be at least an inch, but you can go up to two or three inches depending on how aggressive you are. Okay, and uh, you have some products here that people can use? We have bags of bark. Okay. Um, this is a fir bark, a uh, walk-on mulch. Uh, for a small project, I would suggest coming here and getting a couple bags. But uh, for a larger project, uh, it's more economical for the gardener uh, to go to one of the yards, like uh, AgriTurf, Santa Barbara Stone, or Goleta Building Materials, right. and getting either a pickup truck or having them deliver to your front yard. And then we've got the free stuff from Marburg, all the, there's, from, there's from the county stuff site. from Marburg. So Correct. a lot of ways to go. Uh, there's a lot of ways to go. Even if you know a, a, um, a tree trimmer, they're sometimes looking to get rid of their chips. Oh, the and stuff they throw through the... They throw through the grinder yeah. into the back of the truck. They're looking to get rid of it. And um, you can get on a list, you can call people, and they will come <clears throat> and dump in your driveway oh, great. for so, free. So yeah, very another way to go. So um, I know there's a lot of misconceptions for people, compost, mulch, they use the two terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Could you just help a little bit with the difference between mulch, which you were just discussing, uh -huh. and compost when you use them? Okay, so um, mulch is for a soil cover that goes on top of the soil. Generally, it's a larger uh, piece size of organic matter. It can be anything, wood, uh, straw, large leaves, um, mulch can really be anything. And then conversely, uh, compost goes into the soil. Typically, it's been uh, broken down. Uh, the composting process has started. It's less chunky. It's a finer material, and it goes into the soil to feed uh, the plants. So the it becomes part of the food web that supports all the other stuff we've been talking about. Sure, humic acids, that type of thing will come from compost, and they'll be in the soil and they help bring the structure together. Great, thanks. Now that we have the right ingredients for creating perfect soil, you're on your way to having a healthy, happy garden. Next, we'll join Sam Dickinson from Santa Barbara County and learn how kitchen scraps can turn into fabulous compost. Hi guys, my name is Sam and I'm here today to talk to you about how you can compost where you live. There's many ways of composting. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on how you collect your kitchen waste um, and basically mix it with yard waste in your backyard and make your own compost. In your kitchen, you can start collecting food scraps. Um, examples of food scraps are avocados that have gone bad, so you can actually just throw the whole thing into your kitchen collection container we have coffee grounds with the paper filter. The whole thing can go into your collection container. Citrus, wet paper towels, this is a big one. So a lot of people use paper towels to wipe up messes. You can actually throw that all into your ki kitchen collection container. We have some spinach here that's gone bad or any sort of lettuce, any sort of food cuttings can actually just go into your collection container. So here I have my collection container. It's not too big because I don't want it to just sit in my kitchen for too long. Every few days I'm forced to take this out to my backyard and that's a good thing. Um, you can rinse it out and then bring it back in. No odor, no problems, it's easy. Composting is a great thing to do for the environment. Basically 19% 
of what we're throwing in the trash is food. Believe it or not, 19%. We are throwing away a lot of food and yard waste into our trash, unfortunately. When you're throwing away all of this stuff, it takes up about 30% of what we're throwing away. It could actually be made into compost where you live. So you should be saving this material and composting it in your backyard. Um, right now, your hand is the last hand to ever touch what you're throwing in the trash. It's just gonna go out to Tahigas landfill and be buried and start making methane gas. Methane gas is a very potent greenhouse gas. When you compost where you live, you're not gonna make methane gas because there's oxygen present and you're just making a little bit of CO2. This is the Earth Machine compost bin. They're available from the county for half off, only $45. And you can just go to the transfer station uh, located off El Sueño um, and pick one up and bring it home. Make sure that you place it in a shady area that's level, close to a water source, and preferably close to where you're gonna be bringing out your food scraps from. From your kitchen, you can bring your container out to your earth machine compost bin or whatever compost system that, that you're using. You can take the lid off here and simply empty out the contents of your kitchen container into the compost. And then ideally you would cover this up with some yard waste, which you're saving next to it. Um, you can even use mulch. That's a really easy thing to layer on. And basically you're gonna keep your food covered with uh, whatever yard waste or mulch that you have at all times. And then I like to stir it all every few weeks and add more water. After a few months, we're gonna get some finished compost. It's gonna look just like this. And we're actually just gonna take it over to the little herb garden over here and we can apply it either to the surface or mix it in. And then you can actually plant directly into this. And this is some really, really good soil that's gonna really nourish your plants. Once we have our compost added into the soil, we can add our plant. So, here we go. A Little bit of mint added into the herb garden here. So, this compost is light and fluffy, and it's actually going to nourish the soil. It's going to help conserve water. Um, it can be used as a mulch and actually help uh, prevent evaporation. Now that we have our plants in the ground, um, planted with that lovely compost around it, that plant's gonna grow lots of leaves. Eventually, some of those leaves are going to die and I'm gonna put them back into the system. So now that we've added this compost into our garden, we can feel good because we're conserving landfill space. Uh, we're actually helping save water by using this compost. Um, it really helps prevent evaporation. And also we're closing the loop here. So we're adding organic material from our own property back into our property instead of feeding the landfill. And that's how we've turned kitchen scraps into something that's not only good for the garden, but also reduces waste in our landfills. For more information, go to lessismore.org. We'll be right back after this. It's 4 a.m. Do you know what your sprinklers are doing? Broken drip emitter. Gurgling spray head. Missing drip emitter. Dog. Micro sprayer overspray. Broken pipe. Runoff. Check your sprinklers for leaks and repair. Let's save together. I 
and checked my toilet for leaks and made repairs. I only do full loads in my washing machine and my dishwasher. I save my shower water to water my landscaping. I check for leaks by turning off all water and looking for movement in my water meter. Do your part. Get a free water checkup from your water provider. Keep saving water, Santa Barbara County. Santa Barbara is a city of bicyclists. As riders, we need to keep our bikes and our streets safe. By parking your bike correctly on the hitching posts around Santa Barbara, you can keep your bike safe and help others keep theirs safe as well. When locking your bike to these hitching posts, it's important to park them properly. Park your bike next to one of the rings on the side of the hitching post. This will prevent blockage of the sidewalk and you will also be able to share a spot with a fellow cyclist. To lock your bike, loop your lock through your front wheel and the frame of your bike and pass the lock through the small ring on the hitching post. For additional security, we also recommend that you use a cable to secure your rear wheel. This additional step will ensure that your bike is safe and rideable when you return. When you lock your bike right, you'll help keep Santa Barbara a great place to ride. When bicycling is easier for everybody, it helps reduce traffic and congestion on the streets. So make sure you're in the loop and bike safely, Santa Barbara. Our area is blessed with thousands of plants from Mediterranean regions that will grow in our area. The tough thing is coming up with those few dozen plants that we'll actually use in our garden. In our last episode, I took you through a general overview of the plant database that we have online. This time we're going to dive a little bit deeper. Hi. In a previous segment, I took you through the WaterWise plant database that's at this fabulous website. Uh, and it gave you a general tour of all the different resources that are there. Today we're going to focus in on the most important stuff to most people who are watching, and that's how to find the right plants for your garden. We're looking for plants that'll be beautiful, that'll grow well in your garden, and that'll be sustainable and save you a lot of water. So let's take a little look at the site here. Um, I'm at waterwisesb.org. You can get there too. And I'm going over to the landscape column kind of makes sense, and clicking on that. Uh, these are some of the resources that we talked about previously, uh, how to adjust your water system, smart uh, irrigation technology, things like that. But today we're going over to landscaping and going down to the conveniently titled Virtual Garden Tours Plant Database. You know it is uh, VGTPD, but that's not going to stick either. So let's take a click and see what we've got. Beautiful landing page. Uh, that plant you're looking at there is called flannel bush, Fremontodendron, a uh, really fabulous plant. And the way we're gonna find plants for you to use today, uh, there's four different ways, and I wanna show you a little bit of each one, and then I'll show you how it works. So I'm going to landscapes, and there's two choices here. We can go to tours or galleries. So let's click on tours. What we've got here are photographs, uh, photo galleries actually, of a number of gardens here in the Santa Barbara area. And they're in all different styles. So uh, I would recommend starting with looking at something and going, oh, that's similar to the kind of garden I'm trying to create. So here's the Pacific Spanish garden. Uh, we've got 9, 10, 11, 12. We've got a whole bunch of them showing here. Um, and from this point, um, I'll show you in a second how we get deeper into this. So one way to get there is garden tours. Another is to go to galleries. Uh, what galleries does is, is instead of individual homes, it's showing you situations. So this has front yards, and it's just photographs of front yards with a variety of things. Um, other categories, backyards, hillsides, parking strips. That's a tough one for a lot of people. Why do you put in those little uh, four foot, five foot wide areas? Uh, entries, patios, so these are landscape situations, but there's also a few other uh, nice things here uh, that just show garden features, uh, such as arbors, benches, uh, not something that we're going to grow in our garden, but it'll still give you some ideas for your own garden. Um, sections on fences, gates, hedges, that sort of thing. So that's two of the ways in. I'm going to show you a couple more, and then I'll show you how all of this works. Um, another way in, and this is where we'll, be, where we'll be spending a little bit more time, is helpful plant lists 
and that groups uh, plants by their own category. So firewise trees, screens and hedges, very handy, uh, ground covers, etc. So another way in. And let's look at one more. Going to plants, guided search. Uh, we'll be back here in a minute, but I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, what this section allows you to do is set different criteria that narrow down all of the selections so you can find uh, a number of plants that would work for you. So let me give you a quick look. Uh, I'm going to go back to tours. And, uh, oh, let's show off a garden that I designed a few years ago. This is called the Purple Haze Garden. What you see when you get to any of these pages is an overall photograph of the landscape. Uh, this shows that we have nine different photographs to go through here. You can click Next and look at other views of it. And you'll also notice that there are these uh, little boxes around the photographs of the plant. So here's a cool looking plant a lot of us are familiar with. One rollover shows me some brief information about the plant. This is a century plant, its common name, some general information. That may be enough uh, for you to say, yeah, let's go look a little bit deeper. Um, but I'm going to back out of this for a moment and give you a, a little broader approach to design. So uh, just to illustrate how you might think about uh, designing your garden, um, you don't have to do an illustration like this, but think about the different categories or sizes of plants that you need just to get, help you with your search. You might need some trees off the side of the patio for shade. This shows a couple of different types of trees. You might need some tall plant material for screening or to uh, section off the garden. Uh, we've got medium-sized plants. I call those the mussel. Uh, and then we've got low-growing plants. The ground covers might be a lawn-type substitute or the low-growing ground covers. So think about those four categories. When you're getting ready to choose plants, there's four criteria that I use. One is to think whether or not the plant needs to provide a certain function in the garden. Provide shade, screening, something I can walk on, erosion control. Those are plant functions. Think about the general size the plant needs to be to do that. If we need a ground cover, it's going to be a low-growing plant. If it's going to be a tree, we need a taller plant or a screening shrub. Consider whether that plant wants to grow where you're going to put it. You've got sunny areas in your garden, shady areas in your garden. You have well-drained areas, maybe. You have low drainage areas. Those are all things you'll see in the plant database that you should consider before you put a plant on your list. And then last thing is what's the plant's appearance. I know we all start with ooh shiny, but if it doesn't pass these first three tests, it really doesn't go in your garden. So think about the color scheme, that sort of stuff later. Let's switch things up a little bit here. Uh, this is a beautiful little uh, patio. Uh, it's titled University Garden. It happens to have been done by Owen Dell, who was my partner uh, years ago when we did, um, what was the name of that show? Oh, Garden Wise Guys, that's who we were. So this is uh, one of Owen's gardens, and uh, I'm thinking uh, back to that idea of categories of plants that I need. I need some kind of tree. It's going to be close to the patio. I want something that's pretty, uh, gives me some year-round interest. And lo and behold, here is Forest Pansy Redbud. That's its uh, common name, botanical name, Cerasus. You don't need to know that. Um, and it tells me it's a small tree, reaches about 25 feet tall. Let's look a little bit deeper. So this is my preview. When I click on it, there's a whole bunch of information here. Shows me another picture of the plant, gives me that description again, and now looking up here, it tells me the anatomy of the plant, that it's a tree, its general height. This is quite a range. Think of it more in the 12 to 25 foot range. Uh, flower color, etc. This tells me what it looks like. Of course, the picture helps too. The next button, I'm, uh, the next click I'm doing is culture, meaning what does it take to grow this plant? Tells me that it'll grow in half sun or full sun. Tells me uh, what type of water it needs, uh, its growth rate, information like that. And then the last thing is somewhat subjective. It says design, and it gives you some idea of styles of gardens that it might fit with. Ranch, woodland, um, I could see this in a traditional sort of East Coast looking garden, um, but this is some general information. So let's say I like this guy. Right here, conveniently, it says plus or add. And a little pop-up here says add this plant to my list. We'll talk about that in a second. 
So now let's look at uh, guided search. This can be, uh, you, you can get kind of deep into this, so let me just show you a few different ways to go. Uh, let's go back to looking for trees. Now let's, let's look at shrubs. So this allows me to say where is it going to grow. We talked about the cultural conditions. Um, it's on the east side of the house. It's going to get a half day sun. Now what else? How, how tall do I want it to grow? Well, it's going to be a screening shrub. So uh, let's say it's going to be in the 6 to 12 foot range. Flower color, I don't care yet. So here's your caution. If you click too many criteria here, it may come up with only one or two plants. So don't be too fussy yet about everything from whether it's uh, paisley to glen plaid to uh, made out of satin or whatever. Uh, so I'm going to click any. That allows all in. What type of soil do you have? Unfortunately, uh, and fortunately, clay soil. And when do I want it to bloom? I don't care as long as it blooms. So I'm clicking any. And here we are with four pages of plants that meet these criteria. It's a shrub, half sun, 6 to 12 feet, any flower color, clay soil, any flowering season. And it's showing me all of these plants on page one and I got four more pages to go. So you can see how valuable this will be for getting you started. Uh, from this, we're now going to look for a few plants we like, do a little bit more research on them, going to add a couple to my list. Now I've got eight. So that's how we find plants. Four different ways to get in there. Um, now let's look at what we've just generated, because this is a really excellent, powerful tool. This is called My List, and we'll click here. And here is a list of plants. Um, and there's different ways of looking at these plants. So here's my list. I've got Cleveland sage, Westringia, Festuca, etc. My first choices. An important thing is, will all these plants grow together? Do they all want the same amount of water? So let's click hydrozones. That means plants of similar water needs. And it shows me here all the plants that fit in zone one plants needing very little amounts of water. I've got two of those. Plants needing low amounts of water. I've got one, two, three, four, five of those. And one plant that's a little bit outside of that, medium water needs. Does that mean you shouldn't use it in your garden? No. Um, I think it means don't go crazy with them and just make sure that these one or two plants that are a little more luxurious um, or a little bit uh, more needy get the proper amount of water. That might just mean adding a few more emitters around it on your drip system or giving it an, an additional hand watering. If I just want to see how the garden might look all put together, I can click all pictures and it's showing me a report with, uh, with all of the pictures. I'm kind of liking what I'm seeing here. Um, I can go to plant details. This is a very detailed list of everything about each plant. And another way to look at it is the plant list. This might be your handiest way to go. It's got the photos. It's got all of your information. Hope this has been really helpful for you. Uh, it's a tool that I use all the time, even as a professional. It's a great way to just stimulate your brain and, and, and get you thinking about what will work for your garden. So thanks. Hope it did some good. It's free. It's powerful. So crank up your computer. Go to waterwisesb.org. And take it for a test drive. Next, we'll hear from Kathy Pere about a very important topic in managing your irrigation system. Hi, I'm Kathy Pere with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. Today, we're going to talk pressure in your irrigation system. Pressure is the Goldilocks of your irrigation system. Too much pressure, and you're going to see misting. The water's going to blow off site, and it's totally inefficient. Too little pressure, your sprinklers don't pop up. The water doesn't throw where it's supposed to go. You get dry spots. What we're looking for is pressure that's just right. The way to start looking for that is to start at the house. We want to find out how much pressure we actually have in our system. I'm going to show you how to do that. Let's go check it out. The best place to start checking your pressure is the first hose bib you have in your front yard that comes off of the main line, your water main line from the street. You use a pressure gauge and you screw it onto that hose bib. Make sure you've got a rubber washer in there, otherwise it's gonna splash water all over you when you turn it on. Make sure it's tight.
and then you turn the water on and see how high your pressure is. Pop-up sprinklers work most efficiently at 35 PSI. Drip systems between 20 and 25 PSI. As you can see at this hose bib off the main line, we've got 80 coming onto this property. So let's go and check a drip system, one that the homeowner uses that comes off of this hose bib and see how we can reduce it and make it efficient. You can see on this one, it's streaming. We are not dripping water on the plant slowly. So we're gonna need to reduce the water pressure to make this work more efficiently. So we're gonna talk about how to quick reduce the pressure on a drip system. Number one thing on a drip system, whether it's an in-ground valve or you're using a hose bib to apply water, you have to have a pressure regulator filter assembly. This will reduce the pressure to 20 to 25 PSI. If you're coming from a hose bib, well, we figured that already was 80 PSI starting. You can use this. If it's totally on, you can turn it down. Look at your drip irrigation, and when it goes from streaming to dripping, make a note. That's where you want to turn the water on when you're watering your irrigation and your plants up front. You don't want to drown them. So make sure you're dripping and not streaming when it's on drip systems. You have to look at your irrigation system while it's running to determine whether you've got too much pressure and misting, which we're certainly seeing here. If you're getting misting, that water's blowing off site and it's not going to the surface down to the plants. We're gonna need to reduce the pressure to make this run much more efficiently. We talked about a system to reduce the pressure to the whole irrigation system so you don't have to do each one at every valve. This is a pressure reducing valve. It goes on the main line to your irrigation system. It takes the pressure from the 80 PSI that's up front and reduces it down to 40 PSI. Well, we reduce the pressure. We have that valve on the side of the house where we could turn it down. We also have the option of a, a, on off, kind of like a hose bib. So we turn the pressure down on that for the sprinklers. And look at this, it's just right. We don't have misting. The water is coming down in little droplets to the plants. If you haven't been able to reduce the pressure because maybe you don't have a pressure regulating valve on your irrigation system or you don't have a shutoff valve that you can control the flow, you can still reduce the pressure by replacing your existing sprinkler bodies with pressure regulating bodies. You can tell the difference because they'll say PRS on the top, pressure, pressure regulating sprinkler, and that'll bring them down to 35 PSI, then your pressure will be just right. Thanks for joining me today in exploring water pressure. Hopefully this is gonna let you go home, turn your irrigation on, look at it. Do you have low pressure or high pressure? I would look for high pressure. That's the most common problem with irrigation system efficiency, and you can do something about it. So take what you've learned, make some adjustments, make sure you get that pressure just right for the most efficient irrigation possible. If you want some assistance, contact your local water agencies. We're there to help. Thank you, Kathy. For more information, go to waterwisesb.org. You know, we're all part of creating positive change in our community and having a beautiful, responsible, water-wise garden is part of the puzzle. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Billy Goodnick. Stay water-wise, Santa Barbara. <laughs>